of Kohelet. For those of you who may not have been here in the beginning, Kohelet is a very important book. Not everyone realizes the importance of it. We learn many parts of the Torah, the Chumash, Gemara, the Mishnayot, Halachot. This is not just a, an extra book written by Shilomo HaMelech. This, along with Mishlei and Shira Shirim, are very significant. The reason why this is an important book is because Kohelet describes or talks about life, his experiences, his knowledge. He's able to share with us what he has seen, and he has seen basically everything there is to see, even though he only lived to the age of 52. But he was given a tremendous amount of knowledge, and as a king, the many responsibilities that he had, uh, the access that he had to all kinds of things in life, even though we think we're so advanced because of technology that we have things he didn't have, he has things that we still don't have. <laughs> we're able to travel from here to Israel in 15 hours, he would be able to do that in a couple minutes because he had the ability to use demons. And demons can go from one end of the world to the other end of the world in a very short time. So even though he may have taken a longer route <laughs> using boats and ships, he had the ability he had many abilities that we don't have. And what he's trying to convey to us is the proper ashkafa, is that we should have the proper outlook towards life. Don't get mixed up by what you see, because what you see is not always what you get. <laughs> things are deceiving. There's a lot of things in life that it's only an illusion. But life as a whole is a dream. And we're only here for a short time. And it would be a shame for us not to understand the basics. The basics of what life is all about and what is expected of a Jew, especially. Since he's speaking mostly to the Jew, but many of his topics or many of the themes in this book really applies to all of humanity. So there are certain things that he emphasizes and certain things that he de-emphasizes. And he makes a point to remind us that attitude is very important, that we have the right attitude, that we know how to deal with situations, situations over which we don't always have control. And, of course, it's important to keep in mind that at all times the special gift that we have as human beings, and that is the gift of free will. To exercise free will, we are accountable for our actions. So even though certain things are beyond our control, there's a certain degree of free will, nevertheless which we've spoken a little bit about already in the past, in which areas does free will apply and which areas does not apply. There are many topics in Kohelet. It's not just about one area, one topic. There are quite a few topics of which one we discussed at length, and that is the topic of the Mazal. And this topic is not very well understood by many people. What is Mazal? What is free will? How do the two relate to each other? predestination, what for? Hashem has to give us a destiny when we're born. In other words, we have it all written. It's all mapped out. These are many issues that people sometimes ponder, sometimes they don't think about. People have many questions. And you'd be surprised that many of the answers to these questions are found in Kohelet, in Mishlei, in other parts of the Torah. People don't bother to search for them. People are not even bothering asking questions today. They're too busy text messaging right? or doing other kinds of things. Think a little bit about life. Don't you have any questions? And if you do, why don't you try to find out the answers? So in Kohelet, Kohelet supplies us quite a few answers, gives us many explanations. And of course, it's important to learn the commentaries that go along with the text because reading the text by itself sometimes is a, is a riddle. Some of the words are hard to follow. Some of it makes sense. Some of it is easy to understand, but not all. So it's important to learn the commentaries and have a deeper understanding of, of his message. And that's what, what the shiur is all about, is to go a little bit deeper beneath the text. What is his real message? What is he trying to tell us? And believe me, every word that he says is so helpful, because if one really understands Kohelet and really absorbs every word he says, his life is really a different kind of life. He doesn't have the worries and anxieties that many people have. Because a lot of the worries and anxieties is as a result of ignorance. 
people don't understand why are things happening to them? What's going on in their life? What is going on in the world? Where is this all leading to? That's, that's the importance of learning. Ignorance is the worst enemy of man. If for a Jew to be ignorant of his tradition, it's, it's, it's even worse. He has no idea then what, he, what he's expected to do and accomplish in this short life. So the earlier on we have this information, the more successful our life will be. The outcome will depend on if we have the right attitude, if we understand what is expected of us. It will make a difference in our shalom bayit, husband and wife relationship, raising children, business partnerships, how to deal with troubles, illnesses, problems of all kind. It all will make a difference depending on if you know certain things, if you have the knowledge of certain concepts. Maybe you want to just check it out. Yeah. It will make a big difference, tremendous difference, I assure you. If you know certain things in trying to understand why certain things happen. It doesn't mean that even if you know it, you're going to abide by it, you're going to implement what he says. That's a different uh, idea altogether. People know many things they don't always do as they're told. They don't always do as they know. Nevertheless, those of us who are serious, those of us who really want <coughs> to do what's right, want to have the right attitude in trying to, as best as possible, as humanly as possible, to understand and figure out what the risk to figure out in life, this is a very helpful book. So the next pasuk that he discusses is as follows. Yadati ki en... We said with that one we covered. Yadati ki kola sheri asya Elohim hu yye leolam alav en losif un meno en ligroa ve Elohim asa shiru milfanav. This pasuk really contains several ideas in one. First he says like this, I know that everything that Hashem has made, everything that He has created, from the very beginning, that is what will always be. You cannot add or detract. Whatever Hashem brought into this world has a purpose. There is a need for it. If Hashem created, it's going to stick around. The only thing that does not stick around is that which has a nefesh haya, a living spirit, because they die. But the next generation comes. Whatever Hashem intended for this world is going to be there, and it's there for a reason. Otherwise, He wouldn't have created it. And since He wants it, He wants it to, for it to be the way it is, for us not to try to make any changes to it, not to add to it, and not to take away from it. One of the things that he's referring to, I mean, he's referring to a lot of things that Hashem wants in this world, and therefore, if that's his plan, we cannot change it. But can we really change it? I mean, what is he trying to tell us? Do we have the power to change? Yes. Sometimes we have the power to destroy. That's what Hashem created. So obviously, he's telling this is for a reason. He's not just telling us, oh, by the way, don't try changing. You won't be successful. At times, in certain things, we can do things that are not right. Witchcraft is one of those examples that it goes against Hashem's plans. Witchcraft, those that do damage, hurt other people through witchcraft, it's not necessarily going according to Hashem's plans. You're using methods of the impure forces, kishuv, right, to go against Hashem's will. Right? The Torah has hukim, mishpatim, mitzvot, guidelines of what to do, what not to do. When we, of course, do something that is wrong, that is against Hashem's will, then obviously we're doing what He does not want us to do. But there's only so much the man mankind can do. We're limited. One of those areas that Hashem, of course, intended is for certain species to exist. Certain animals, certain bugs, certain birds, right? And He created them. And if you, if you read the Torah carefully, you will notice that the Torah uses the word leminam or leminehim. Even though it mentions a category of certain animals or birds that are kosher and non-kosher, it does also say that there are others like it that belong to this family of birds. So you may ask, did Hashem make all these dogs? 
There's so many kinds of dogs. Hashem did not make one dog. When he created the dog and he created the cat and he created the sheep, he created subspecies or similar, I should say similar species that are related, different color, different shape perhaps, a little bit, I mean, different, there's some differences because there are different types. Just like there are different types of people, they look differently. The same thing with all the species in the world. There's some beautiful birds that you've never seen if you live here in Southern California. Have you seen the red cardinal? Not here. They're not around here. You can see them more in the East Coast. Have you seen a toucan? The one with the long beak? That's a tropical bird. Only in Central American forests and in South America will you see it. Same thing with the, with the macaws, of those large parrots. You know, there's all kinds of beautiful creatures and you wonder, wow, there's even one bird that has about seven, eight colors. Not one, not two, about six or seven that I counted. The belly is purple, then yellow, and then red in the beak, and black around there, and white. So, wow! Hashem created all this for a purpose. Obviously, there's a lot of beauty in the creation, there's a lot of design, but there's also purpose. And Hashem does not want us to change this. All the species and subspecies that He created are for a reason. So, the various dogs that you see, some of them are interbred that man has made by interbreeding, but some of them in the very beginning of creation, you had a poodle, you had a German Shepherd, or something similar to it. There's no evolution on the scale of, from a dog going to a different animal, right? There is small evolution, what we call microevolution, that certain animals or certain people change a little bit because of their geographical location, because of all kinds of things. So it, Animals, dogs, or any birds, even owls. There's something called a barn owl. It's different than the owl that you see in the forest. Different colors, different size, right, and so forth. In the very beginning, Hashem made various kinds of owls, not just one. Various kinds of eagle. You think a bald eagle is only an American eagle? <laughs> bald eagle, right, the symbol of, of this country. No, there were various kinds of eagles that Hashem created. The minehem. And Hashem wanted, it, Hashem wanted it to stay this way, that there should be certain kinds, certain species for some reason. Did you ask something? Yeah, uh, about like a man, we have a black or a female. Okay, that's a different topic. Yeah, that, that was, I already covered that. You said it's maybe couple men, couple women. No, in the beginning there's only two kinds. Man, one kind of a man and one kind of a woman. And how this comes to be so We discussed this already. It's a different topic. We talked about geographical locations having oh. some influence okay. over, people's, the black is not over people's looks. And, uh, yeah, over people's looks. People, uh, people are affected. People are affected by climate and by the foods they eat. I don't want to go into that topic. Oh. It's, uh, otherwise, we're, we're going to be here forever. We already discussed that topic. The topic of why people look the way they do, why there are differences. It's a whole topic. We discussed it. You know, I, I, I can't take the time to discuss it right now. But there are certain changes that occur, small changes that occur as a result of location. Now, for a species to become extinct can only come about if Hashem agrees. You understand what I mean? For a species to become extinct, like dinosaurs, they became extinct. There are certain animals today that have become extinct. Wait, we, you just said that things are supposed to stay around forever. This is the way Hashem wanted it. How come certain animals have become extinct? And by the way, they have become extinct for a variety of, through various ways. One could be overhunting. The only species in the world that is blessed to never become extinct fish. is the fish. You know why? Because the Japanese need sushi, <laughs> right? So in order to have a lot of sushi, a lot of fish, Hashem gave them a blessing in creation. They have a blessing. They are blessed. Right? There's a blessing that fish will always multiply. And that's why their nature is to lay many eggs 
And you're not going to have one fish like an elephant has one elephant. And you know how long it takes an elephant to have an elephant? Almost two years. Almost two years. They're pregnant for two years? The, the gestation period of an elephant is about 700, almost 700 days. 660 days on the average. The gestation, pregnancy period. A mouse is only two to three weeks. Wouldn't it be nice? You can, a woman can give birth after three weeks? No? Nine months? Nine months? The closest one to a human being is a cow. We discussed this already, I think, right? Last week? The gestation period of various animals. Like kol zman ve'et, we said. Everything has a time. Right? A lion and a tiger. About five months. There's a reason for it. Right? Of course, if it's a rhinoceros or a hippopotamus, it's going to be more than that. The larger animals usually have longer gestation periods. So, all of these things are pretty much set. They're set. But there are things that have changed. And one of them is certain animals that have become extinct. If something has become extinct, what we need to know is it's behaskamata kadosh Baruch Hu. Kadosh Baruch Hu had had to agree to it. If this is the way he wants his world, he has to agree if something is going to change. For whatever the reason is, something's going to become extinct because of overhunting. It's going to become extinct. He has to agree to it. If he doesn't agree to it, then it will not become extinct. So many species have become extinct because of overhunting that we don't see today that we had. Look at Israel. Do you know that once upon a time Israel had lions? like in Africa and in Asia. Lions. The last lions disappeared approximately 800 years ago, 800, 900 years ago from Israel. Up until, the, right before, around the time of the Crusades. That's when the last lions were seen there. No more. Do you know how many lepers are left in Israel? I think about 10. There's still some, only 10 left mostly in the Negev and close to Engedi area. Do you know that there was a cheetah in Israel up until the early 60s? Cheetahs. You think of cheetah? Cheetah in Israel? In Africa? No, Israel had cheetahs too until the early 60s. How about the bear? Yeah, not till about 60, 70 years ago there was still the brown, the Syrian brown bear in Syria, in Lebanon, northern Israel. It was bears, little by little. What happened? Human beings move in, they take away their habitat. That's number one. If you take their animals, their prey, then they don't have what to eat. You still have hyenas, enough of them. <laughs> A lot of them in the Knesset. <laughs> <Yeah>. Anyway. <laughs> huh? Yeah. So anyway, here you have animals from a certain location becoming extinct. They still exist everywhere else. You have a few lions left, Asian lions left in the Gir Desert, or Gir Forest, I should say, of uh, Rajasthan state in India. The Asian lion, until recently you had this Asian lion in Iran. The last one was found dead in the 1950s, not too far from uh, Bushehr, I think not too far from Shiraz. You had lions in Iraq at the turn of the century. Now there's a small concentration in India. The rest of them are African lions in Africa. Right? That's how it is. You have all kinds of animals that are no longer uh, in a particular place where they did exist once upon a time. In order for it to become extinct, however, Hashem has to agree. And when Hashem agrees for something to become extinct, what it means is that there's no more need for it. With wild animals, well, Baruch Hashem, because they would interfere with life. Could you imagine going down the, I don't know, Beersheba and seeing a lion, right? It was a curse. It was not good if the wild animals came out from the forest and attacked and came in. Until today, in Bangladesh, in East India, you have villages where leopards take the little kids. A leopard is not like a tiger. 
A leopard is not so afraid. It actually will go in where people live. Tigers usually stay away. They, they may do a lot of damage to tigers. They're very, very tough, right? But you have leopards coming in, taking babies, taking little children. They, they suffer from that in the villages there. You'd rather have lions than terrorists. Yeah, well, yeah. Or a different animal. Anyway, it's only Shamayim. That's what's important to remember. It makes no difference what it is. It's only Shamayim. So, in the end, if it becomes extinct, it's Baskamat Hashem. Hashem agreed. And apparently, if he agrees, that means that there's no more need for it. Do we have a need for dinosaurs today? I don't think so. If there's no more need for something, Hashem could take it away easily. There was one animal that almost became extinct in the 20th century, and that is the biggest animal that ever was created that's still around today. All the dinosaurs that were big are gone, but there's one that's bigger than all the dinosaurs that is still around. Blue whale. The blue whale. The biggest blue whale on record that they've seen or caught is a, was 110 feet. You know how long 110 feet is? You could swim in the biggest artery. The heart is the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> what did they catch blue whales for? They caught, they love to catch the blue whales because it supplied them with many, many gallons of oil and blubber, the meat. One big fish like that, you know how long it will last you? And they slaughtered thousands of them in the, in the early part of the century. Once the harpoon was developed and they were able to really catch it, it was difficult. How are you going to catch such a big fish? In the old days, forget it. People lost their lives trying to catch even smaller whales. But with technology, they were able to, unfortunately, kill a lot of animals. Even today? Even today. Japan and China? Sure, sure, sure. Exactly. So this one slaughtered thousands of them until they made an international ban. This blue whale almost, they say, almost became extinct. And now it's recovered. There's about 5,000, maybe, maybe more, all over the world. Beautiful animal. Beautiful creature. Right? So Kadosh Baruch Hu apparently stopped them. That too, everything is Bashgaha. That's what I'm pointing this out. It could have become extinct. The whales don't have the same Beracha as regular fish. And that is why a blue whale, they don't really know with whales the exact gestation period. It's at least a year and a half for the blue one, for the big ones. 500 and something days for it to have a baby. And it's not going to have a litter of four or five at once like some dogs and mice and cats, right? They can have litters, right? Like opossums, <laughs> you know? Wholesale. <laughs> no, this one, it's going to have one. One. You know how long it takes to have another one? So if you kill one, especially a young one, then you're reducing the chances of the reproduction. So Hashem did not want that to happen. What does happen, however, in the world, that Hashem does occasionally make changes, major changes, is to the laws of nature. Nature has laws, and we discussed that in the very beginning, that Hashem made laws. There's laws of physics. Everything works with, according to laws. Gravity. If you throw something up, it comes down. Now, on the moon, it's going to take longer for it to come down. Right? In space, it's not going to come down. Unless it's close to a... a, a a body that will, because of the gravi gravity, it will pull it. Right? There's something called gravity. There's laws. These laws are there for a reason. The world is organized. The world is set up by a creator who designed it, and therefore there's laws. It's not hefker, just the way it wants to function. No. Things work according to set rules and laws. Your organs, too. The organs in the body, usually, unless they get sick, they function in a certain way. Try to drink gasoline, <laughs> and you're going to get yourself in trouble. Your stomach is not made to handle gasoline, <laughs> right? You can't drink that stuff. You're going to kill yourself, right? So the body works according to certain ways, certain rules and laws. Hashem, however, sometimes breaks these rules. When does He break the rules? Whenever you have tremendous disasters in the world, like earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, wildfires, and these things are destructive. People lose their lives. Hundreds of thousands of people sometimes. Right? 
So what's this? This is from Shemaim. This is a This is a decree. Hashem does change His laws, the laws of nature that He set up, by doing something against the laws of nature. But wait a minute, wait a minute. With the earthquake, I heard there's something called a San Andreas Fault. There's faults. There are geological faults in various locations on Earth, the various tectonic plates that move. And that's the way the scientists tell us is, that explains earthquakes. Well, wait a minute, but who put the faults there to begin with? <laughs> okay, let's say it's the faults. So you, ex you can explain it scientifically, but who made the faults? And, and, and by the way, why would Hashem allow something like this to happen with thousands of people losing their life? He doesn't want people to just die. He cre otherwise, why is it, what does He create them for? So just, there's something here that, is, that we don't fully understand, that Hashem's hand is involved. And by the way, if you want to know why he would make it so that an earthquake should happen wherever there is a fault, even though it can happen anywhere, the reason is very simple. If everything was obvious that it's Mishamayim, everybody would do Teshuvah. Everybody would be observant and religious and righteous. There's always going to be, remember this rule, there's always going to be in life some room for mistake to allow for free will. Eh. This happens by chance. Every 25 years, something like this happens. People are going to think that way. And that's what Hashem wants. Hashem does not want everything to be obvious and clear, so He conceals Himself in nature. In nature. It's Him. You think a tornado is not Mishamayim? Well, of course you can give a meteorologic, meteorologic explanation for the turbulence of the hot and cold air. That's the turbulence that's coming out as a result of the mixture of those two kinds of airs. Yeah, of course you can explain it, and it may be true. But who brings that about? Who allows that to happen? Remember, you know what a size 5 tornado is? It, there's a scale of 1 to 5. That's, that's winds of 280 or 300 miles or more per hour. More destructive than any other force in this world as far as winds. More than hurricanes. And some of, these, some of them are a mile wide. Big monsters. They usually don't last too long. The average tornado is not an F5. F2, F3, they stick around for a while. And they're very strange. Tornadoes are known to have made a U-turn. Go, U-turn. Skip this house, go to that house. Pick up a crate of eggs bring it down a mile later without cracking one. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible force in nature that they still don't understand how it works. But it's all Mishamayim. So these are tofa'ot teva, as we call them in Hebrew. These are natural disasters that Hashem brings that, uh, as a result of, obviously, a decree that He sees fit for that particular location. This location, earthquake. This location, wildfire. This location, floods. Only he knows why. We don't understand. We have an approximate idea, by the way. Rabbis tell us why certain things happen. They give us an idea. And obviously it's because of certain sins. So we spoke about adding or removing. Okay. Yes? Why doesn't Hashem speak to us more clearly? I mean, you have freedom of choice. He and did. Through the Torah, He spoke to us very clearly. I understand. But when yeah. you're making a mistake and you're suffering from it through an act of nature, right. you have rapper Banim say, it's because of this sin, it's because of that sin. No one is 100% crystal clear yeah. of why the tornado came, why in the, the in this forest week, fire in Israel came. In this week's parasha, parasha Bechukotai, there are some additional parashiot in the Torah, in Sefer Devarim, like Kitavo and Nitzavim, and Aike Bazino also, that give us an idea of why certain things happen, things that are apparently are, are harmful or bad. Nothing is really bad, but it appears to us like that. And this week's parasha is perfect. The Torah spells it very clearly. What's the most important thing for mankind? The most important thing is that he should be able to prosper economically, that the weather should cooperate so that he should be able to harvest the, the wheat, right, and the fruits. And number three, that he should have no enemies to bother him on the military front. These are the three most important areas to man's uh, um, harmonious interaction <laughs> with nature and, and successful life, right? Three areas, war, rain or weather, 
and economy. Huh? That's, that's for individuals. I'm talking about as a whole for humanity, for the community. There are, of course, more. Like he was saying, Shalom Bayit, marriage, to have kids. I'm talking about as a, as a community, as a nation. There's three major areas of either of a blessing or a curse. Economy, the weather, and the, and the military. Do you have enemies or not? And this, that's, this, that's what this week's parasha is all about, and I have a whole video just about that. Uh, that that's the main theme in the video. It's, crisis, it's called Crisis in Israel. You can see it on the Internet. The Torah says in this week's parasha, in lechu, you follow my statutes, all of these three areas will be just fine. You'll be prosperous. You'll have rain at, in its time, just exact amount when you need it. Too much rain is no good either. At the wrong time is no good either. Plus, you won't have any worries from your enemies. They won't bother you. Great. What happens if these three are not cooperating with you? We don't always have it right enough rain, right? It, we don't have it when we want it, when we need it. We're having trouble with our enemy. We're having terrorist bombs. All the economy is down. All of these are indicators that there's something that we're doing is wrong. Very clear. So the Torah spells that out very clearly. You don't need fancy explanations. Obviously, we would like a little bit to be more specific. Why did the Holocaust occur? The only thing we can do about the Holocaust or Holocausts, because we have more than one, is to give a general explanation of it found in this week's parasha and in Parashat Kitavo. It says why. Why the exact reason? That we don't always know. Who's to blame? We don't always know exactly who exactly is to blame. But we have a general idea. It's a story, but people don't want to bother. People say, oh, what are you talking about? It's nuts. What do you mean? It's, it says so clearly. It tells us in advance, and it even tells us it's going to happen. So don't be surprised when it does. So that's basically the explanation for certain major <coughs> events, catastrophic events, for the Jews or for the non-Jewish world. It's all to remind us Yad Hashem, the hand of Hashem is involved. Nothing happens for no reason. Now, everything that Hashem has made in this world is intended to last forever, except for those that have a living spirit, we said. What do I mean by ever, forever? Take the sun. Do you know that some scientists say that in a, in a couple of, I think they say 10, 20,000 years, the sun is going to finish. No more fuel in the sun. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Whatever Hashem created will, can go on forever. Hashem created it. He wants it. So if He wants it, it can go on forever. There's nothing that's going to take away from it. Nothing that is going to stop it. Because Hashem wants things to last, that is why He doesn't want us to interfere with nature. There is a prohibition, for example, lesares. A human being cannot sterilize himself or an animal for that animal not to be able to, to have kids, to have, uh, you know, a second generation. So if, you're, if you're the owner of a pet, you have a problem because you can't do it and you can't ask somebody else to do it. You may want to buy it already fixed, as they say. A woman who doesn't want to have any more children cannot do something to her body physically to stop having children, because to do something physically is prohibited. A man cannot do something physically either. There are ways that the halacha would allow for a woman to control, to have a certain control over the, over the, over the birth, right? There are certain ways, but not something physically done to the body. That is asur, asur. There's no, there's no permission to do that. And there's no permission to do that to an animal either. That's called sirus. Lo le sares. The other thing is, Hashem does not want us to have any kind of kilaim. Now, you may have heard of kilaim, but there's different kinds of kilaim. Kilaim is shatnez, having wool and linen on your garments, a mixture of the two. You cannot plow a field with an ox and a hamor and a donkey next to each other, it's a form of, you cannot grow certain things close to each other, you cannot graft two kinds of fruits that are very different from each other together to produce a new fruit. Like they say nectarine, a nectarine is a, is a, is a result of the grafting of a peach and a plum. 
in the beginning of creation, you didn't have certain fruits that you have today. Because man has made them. We're allowed to eat it. Once it's done, you're allowed to eat it. But to actually produce something that is mixed, it's going against what Hashem wanted. Hashem did not want this particular fruit. Otherwise, He would have made it. He doesn't want you to do it either. Don't try to, to meddle in the affairs of Hashem in the creation by making all of these kinds of combinations. So that's the meaning of this pasuk that we started off saying, en lo sif en nigro, no adding and no removing, no making any changes. Whatever Hashem wants, that's what He did. He doesn't want us to make a change. This also is true, by the way, with Parnassah, which we already discussed in the past few weeks, that when it comes to one's Parnassah livelihood, you want an extra $10,000 of income? <laughs> you could ask and want all, you, all day long. But if he wrote only this amount this year, only this amount in this mazal or whatever, you can't change it. Usually you can't change it, unless you get a blessing of Beracha or something like that. But otherwise you can't do it. What if I take three jobs? You're not going to be adding one penny more than what they said. And if you do make money in an illegal way, eventually it will be lost through some unexpected expense. <laughs> unexpected, of course. Unanticipated. Because whatever they decided you're going to have, that's what you're going to have. I think it was either the Chafetz Chaim or some other rabbi who once asked, met up with a student after many years of not seeing him. So how are you doing these days? He says, Rabbi, it could be a little bit better. It wouldn't hurt. He says, who told you that? Maybe it would hurt. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> who told you a little bit more would be better? If, what, if, if this is what you have, this is what Hashem wants you to have. If it would be better for you to have more, He would have given you more. Obviously, this is what He wants you to have. So you'd be happy with what He has given you. We can't change these things. Now, even though certain things are set in advance, certain things Hashem has already designed, and wants them to be in a certain way, and we can't change, don't forget that there is an area where we do have free will, where we can make certain changes. Go against his will, right? So that we do, we still, even though we're saying that a man cannot and should not change, it does not mean that he doesn't have the ability to make certain changes. We do have in certain areas the ability to exercise free will and make changes. Why is that important? Not only is it important for reward and punishment, how do you determine if, if a man was good or bad, but without Bechirach of Shit, without free will, there would be no Yerat Shamayim. Because imagine if everything was forced upon us, if everything was dictated, and if everything was controlled from above, and we have no say in the matter, we, we would have no Yerat, no fear. And that's the continuation of the Pasuk here. The second half of the Pasuk is, Ve'elohim asa she'iru'umi lefanav. Hashem has done certain things in this world that people should fear Him. One example, quick example, by the way, that the Gemara says that it intended to straighten us out a little bit is lightning and thunder. The, the lightning and the thunder, the rabbis tell us, is intended to straighten us, straighten the heart. Alev akum, the heart is sometimes twisted, it's not straight. So the ra'amim, the thunders, Hashem sends sometimes to shake us up. People get scared of it. So otherwise, why does Hashem have to have thunders? What do the thunders do? Try to ask any scientist. There's no answer for it. What is a thunder for? He'll explain to you how it happens with the, on, the, on the level of the clouds, how thunders are produced. But, but why? Who needs a thunder? <laughs> right? So the rabbis give us an explanation of what one idea behind the thunder is. There may be other ideas. So, Elohim Asashi Yerumar Hashem wants that people should fear Him. So sometimes He does certain things to restore the fear that may have been lost. People think He's not around. He doesn't see. He doesn't know. So sometimes people are shaken up. So all of these earthquakes, besides the, per, the potential problem, the, 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 the sin that is existing in that area, besides all of that, it acts also for us as a Yirah, to increase the Yirah in us, the fear. Especially in the 21st century when we have the technology like, like internet, where you can see on the spot, do you know that I saw the tsunami in Japan as it was happening? As soon as it started. Right away. Right away. It just happened to be that there was helicopters flying over the, the spot. It just happens to be that they were connected to the internet, the cameras, the news. 
Today, it's not even TV. I mean, it's actually the whole world sees it on the spot across the globe. You're seeing here what's happening in Japan at that moment in live and in color. All this damage, and you say, wow, you, and you've never seen it because remember the last tsunami that happened in Indonesia and in Thailand? We only <coughs> heard about it later. We only saw pictures after the fact. It's also very, very incredible to be able to see pictures of that. Right? Remember, what did they do before they had photographs? And they heard of major earthquakes. They, you know, they, they felt bad for the people. They heard about it in the news. They got letters from relatives. You know, but to know, to see it, is incredible. So we, today we're able to see it and see it even live. You know? There's even pictures of what's going on in the Japanese offices, how it's shaking during the earthquake, how the, everything is falling down, their computers. You're seeing it happening. Yeah, you're seeing destruction as it's happening. That's incredible. What does that do? From across the globe, increasing the yir'ah. It's supposed to do that. Some people say, oh, they'll ignore it. But really, it, it's intended to increase the yir'ah in every individual, not just Jew, in every individual. So that's one part of the meaning of, this, of these words, shayira'um fanav. If there wouldn't therefore be bechira, as we said, there wouldn't be yir'ah. There has to be a little bit of Bechira that we should be able to fear him. Then he says as follows. Ma shehaya kvar hu, va sheliyot kvar haya, berim yivakeshet nirdaf. Whatever is, has already been. What does that mean? Whatever it is has already been I mean, has already been written that it should happen. Whatever you see happening now, it's already written from before. And what will be is already present in the, in the present now. I'm going to first translate, then I'm going to explain it. And God will always, Yivakeshet Nirdaf means he will always try to help the pursued. There is a pursuer and there's one who's being pursued. What we call the victim in English. So, Elohim Yevakeshet Nirdaf, literally translation means, Hashem will seek to protect or to help the Nirdaf, the one who's being pursued, the victim. Okay, that's the translation of this pursuit. So, what does it mean that everything is set? Everything that is now has already been set before. Somebody goes through a tremendous predicament, a tremendous loss of some kind, even though it's happening now, it's already written before. Don't think it just happens now. It is already known from before. Hashem knows about it in advance. And it, it actually, he may have asked for it to happen. Nevertheless, even though somebody hurt someone else, and even though that was already intended and known from before, Hashem will, in the end, hold that pursuer accountable. And he will help the nirdaf. He will go after the person who did it. This is a little bit confusing. What is he trying to tell us over here? He's trying to tell us that even though it was meant to happen, Hashem knew about it, and he knows about it way in advance, so there's a reason for it. Don't think that just because Hashem wants this to happen, for this person to have this loss, that the guy who caused the loss will not have to pay for his actions. He's a criminal. He's a criminal. But let's take an example that the rabbis use, Paro. Do you know that the Torah records that the Jewish people were going to suffer and be in exile in Egypt for a number of years, right? It says so in advance. Abraham Avinu told us. Why is Paro punished then? All he's doing is Hashem's will. Think about it for a second. Did you understand the question here? Everything is known in advance. Whatever happens has already been written that it should happen. That means Hashem wants it to happen. Then why does Paro, the one who's carrying out because the mission from Hashem, why does he get punished for it? It could have happened with us, Paro. He, he didn't have to be the means to carry out the, the, the divine decree. Right. Paro didn't have to do it. But here I'm going to give you, I'm going to surprise you with something. You're right. That's a simple explanation. You don't have to be the one to do it. Let somebody else do it. Hashem usually takes somebody who would want to do it anyway. Uh, in Pirkei Avot, 
actually in various places that the Chachamim discuss this topic, they say, Megalgelin schut al zakai v'chov al chayav. If something good is supposed to happen, that will happen. Hashem will allow that to happen, usually through somebody who deserves to get, get the credit for it. Something bad is supposed to happen. Let somebody who's wicked anyway end up doing it. Okay? He sends the right person. So Hashem uses a person who would want to do it anyway. <laughs> so Reuven, for example, deserves the death penalty. Reuven has to die. There's something he did in a previous reincarnation. Shimon is a murderer. He has murderous instincts. He's a bad person. Reuven lives in this part of town. Shimon lives in this part of town. They usually never meet. On this day, they will meet. And Shimon will be upset for some reason, and he will take out the knife or the gun or whatever and do something. Who do you think brought them together? Hashem. But Shimon is doing what Hashem wants. He would do it anyway. That's, that's why Hashem invited him. You know, I need you, because you're going to do it anyway. So the simple explanation is Hashem uses the ones who are wicked. Hashem uses the ones that would do it anyway. But you're right. Technically, every individual does not have to do it. You don't have to be the one to do it. In the end, it was free will. You were not forced to do it. That's very important. Nobody is forced to do it. The Satan made me do it, like some, some people claim in court. You know, they tell the judge, he was, the Satan was talking to me in the head that morning. You don't have to do it. You're not forced to do anything. Now, what the, I think it's the Ramban says is something incredible. Ramban says, you know what, Paro? If Paro would have only done what Hashem asked him to do, he would not have been punished with all these makot. Why did he get punished? Not because he did what Hashem wanted, because he overdid it. He did it mehadrin nina mehadrin. You know, you can do something and do it just to get by, or you can light many candles for Hanukkah. <laughs> Make it mehadrin, you know. On the eighth day, you can, you can light one candle and fulfill the mitzvah, just one. It's the eighth day. We light eight, because we want to beautify the mitzvah, but Hashem, we can afford it. But also, says, I'm going to do it right. <laughs> so he overdid it. He threw the kids into the, the babies into the Nile. That was not a decree from Hashem. And it was a lot of things he did on his own. A lot of things he did that he was not supposed to do. He overdid it. That's why he's punished. He's punished on what he overdid. How does he know what he's supposed to do and what he's supposed to overdo? He doesn't have to know. That's what we said before. He doesn't have to know. The fact is that Hashem judges people but their thoughts and their intentions, not necessarily here by the mission. So that's the commentary he says. The commentary the Ramban says, that had he only done what Hashem asked of him, because Hashem wanted me to do it. I'm not a real perpetrator, I'm just carrying out his mission. But he, he did more than what he was asked. This brings to mind a very, very incredible topic, and a very interesting topic. You all heard of the trials of Nuremberg? Yes. In Nuremberg, after World War II, you had some Nazis, big leaders, who were tried. Right? And they were hanged. Right. What was the common response of these individuals that when they were asked, what do you plead? Nicht schuldig. I'm not guilty. Why not? I was following orders. So what do you say to that? Could somebody get away by saying he was only following orders? The answer is, they got away with this in World War I. This kind of excuse that today is being called the Nuremberg excuse or the Nuremberg laws was not always consistent throughout history. Some people allowed it. A guy said, I, listen, I was following my officer's orders. I was forced to. The king told me to do it. The one who puts down the guillotine or whatever. So sometimes it happened that people were tried for this and they were found guilty even though they were following their orders of their superiors. What would you say? Is that a good excuse or not? Remember, the Goyim, the non-Jewish world, has not yet fully clarified this because it's, it's a big question. I'm forced. He's telling me. I'm a soldier. I got to do what he's telling me. If I don't do it, he'll kill me. If I do it, now you're going to kill me. <laughs> what should I do? That's what they call in English a catch-22. <laughs> so what do you say, real quickly? Anybody want to have any ideas? 
So it's important to look at Torah Shkafa, obviously, not, not what the non-Jewish world is going to say, because they don't have clarity in this area. And even the Torah, even the Halakha, we don't have the, really, the time to go into all the details. But let me tell you briefly. There are various concepts in, in, in Torah, in Hashkafa, that say, it says as follows. En shaliach ledevar avera. Somebody that sends you to kill someone, and you do it, Ruven sent Shimon, Ruven is not guilty. The sender is not as guilty. In other words, we can't put him to death, even though Bashamayim, he has to pay for it. The one who's guilty is Shimon. Shimon, you don't have to do it. And Shaliyah, Ledvar Avra. You didn't have to listen to me. There's such a concept in the Gemara, in various kinds of situations, where we use this concept of En Shaliyah, Ledvar Avra. You are responsible, you are mature, you are, you are aware of what this is, then you, you don't have to do it. So this is a case where he was not forced. So the guy who pays is the one, the one who committed the crime, not the one who sent him. So there's a certain amount of accountability. The person is responsible for his actions. When you are aware that something is wrong, you have to demonstrate unease. You don't want it. You would rather not do it. If not, you're at least a cohort, I think they call it in English, to the, to the, to the crime. <laughs> No, but that's something else. You're talking about somebody who, who will not follow orders. Yes, anybody who doesn't follow orders is going to get punished. So that's why it's a dilemma. But, but even though a goy, apparently, there's a machloke, there's a discussion amongst rappers whether a goy has to give his life in order not to kill. A Jew cannot commit three cardinal sins, even though it means he's going to lose his life. Cannot kill, cannot commit adultery, right? And cannot uh, worship idols, even if it's going to cost him his life. But a non-Jew does not have that obligation. Bow down to this idol, otherwise we shoot you. He can bow down all day long. He's not obligated to give his life for that, for Kiddush Hashem, for sanctifying God's name. A goy does not have that obligation, that mitzvah. But there's a machloket about shvichut damin, about murder. That's a little bit different. But let's assume even though he, he, that, he's, uh, that he doesn't have to give his life. He doesn't have to give his life. Why should I die for just so that I should not shoot him? Nonetheless, what it comes down to, what it comes down to is some, a, a very fine line here. A human being knows that murder is against the law, against the Torah law, against the human law, something that is, is not right unless it's in self-defense and so forth. If one does not show any, any whatsoever regret, remorse, any hesitation to carry it out, if he belongs to an army, or to a philosophy, or to a group, or to a religion that is pursuing a certain ideal, we're going to make the assumption that you're guilty until you're proven innocent. In other words, usually in this country, and in any normal country, you are innocent until you're proven guilty. You have to prove guilt. Here, you're going to be guilty until you're proven innocent. We're going to assume that if you did not protest, if you did not feel bad, if there's no any indication from the rest, the rest of your life, from the rest of your behavior, if there's no proof that you were against this policy, then we're going to assume you were a Nazi just like, as much as they were. Now, remember, they did not go and get all the soldiers and try them. Here, in the Nuremberg case, they only took the big guys. They took the main leaders who had tremendous amount of influence. And if they really, really wanted, they could have not pursued their job with such zeal. But they did it such a good job. They, they were so... You can, you can see in Streicher, in Mavshemam, you can see that guy, as he was leading... They were leading him to the gallows. He was so upset at the Jews. He said, you Jews, put him fest. 1947 or 46 it was, October, yeah, 46. Purim fest, he says, you have a Purim today. Like Haman, it's downfall, now we have the downfall again. So you Jews are celebrating today again Purim. He was so bitter, so upset, you saw his venom, even as he would, no regrets, no remorse. It's amazing that he knew what Purim meant. More yeah, exactly, Jews. you see. But most Jews don't even know You see Purim. the hatred in them. So yeah. these guys, of course they were guilty. If a guy feels bad, he begins to cry, there's proof that he didn't, he didn't want to do it, he was forced, I'm sure they would have dealt with him differently. Smaller sentence, 
not the death penalty. Smaller sentence, okay, you did something wrong, but he, they would have considered it. But if there's no proof that you were against it, then we have to assume that you were a partner to the crime. Another pirush on this words, Elohim Vakeshet Nirdaf, is be careful never to pursue people. <laughs> it's better always to be the victim, the one being pursued, because Hashem is going to take the side. Many times Hashem takes the side of the one who's being pursued. He feels bad for him. So if, if you have a choice, <laughs> you don't want to ever be called a pursuer. I mean, if you're defending yourself with something else, but don't be ever try to take the role of a pursuer. There are times that we don't, we don't know about this. He tells us Hashem vakesh tanirdav and he protects them, but there are times we don't know about it. Who does know about it? The goyim. There's something in Tehillim, in, in Halel, that we say that we don't understand what we're saying. This question was posed to a big rabbi once. By goyim, ministers. Hey, rabbi, how can you say hallelujah Hashem kol goyim? Shabbehu kol haumim. Praise Hashem, nations of the world. Give praise to God. Nations of the world should praise God. The Jewish nation should praise God. Why do the non-Jews have to praise God? Because they know all the times, the plots, that they plotted against the Jews that Hashem frustrated their plans. We don't know about them because they were discussed behind closed doors, meetings. Do we know all about what was going on right now in Ahmadinejad and Khamenei and all these guys in Iran, what they're plotting, that did not succeed? We only know what is evident what came out. Do you know what plans the Goyim, throughout history, the Goyim had many plans. Some, of course, they went through, but some of them did not. At the last minute, could be somebody raised, raised an objection. Ah, I gotta go see my mother-in-law. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what the reason was, and the whole thing was canceled, because he goes, goes to see his mother-in-law. Let's push it off. Because they pushed it off, they, really, they forgot about it. You think that was just by chance? It was mir shamayim. So there are many times we don't know. So who knows? The goyim know <coughs> what they intended to do. Therefore, hallelujah, et Hashem kol goyim. They should give praise to Hashem. Okay, now we're going to go into another topic. In the next few minutes, we're going to go into a topic that's in the series called the Seven. And that's called Madua Tzadik Veraro or Rasha Vetovlo. Why does it appear to us sometimes that there's no Ashgacha, there's no divine providence, Hashem is left the scene? It appears sometimes like that that there's no Tzedek. And that's the next Pasuk. Vod Raiti Tachat Hashemesh, Mekoma Mishpat, Shama Resha, Mekoma Tzedek, Shama Rasha. Simple meaning, one of the simple meanings is that I see under the sun, Wherever there's supposed to be justice, for some reason there's some wicked judges that are taking people who are really innocent and finding them guilty. Bekoma mishpat, supposed to be justice, shama resha? Bekoma tzedek, where there's supposed to be justice, shama rasha? Who's sitting as a judge? Wicked, corrupt judges. You see that today too. What's going on? So, one explanation given by Yonatan ben Uziel is whenever you see corrupt judges and therefore corrupt justice, it's Ba'avon Hador, the generation deserved that. Otherwise, they wouldn't be appointed. You get what you deserve. You get the leaders you deserve, you get the judges you deserve. Okay, that's just one way of looking at it. But the reality is, there's a lot more to this. When there's a lack of justice, we want, we want to know why. We're talking about intelligent judges who are not biased, hopefully, who are objective, they can make mistakes. And last week we said that even though a judge makes a mistake, don't worry. In the end, Hashem corrects mistakes. If you were not supposed to lose that money in Bed Din, in that Dayan, that judge or whatever, made a mistake, you're going to get the money back somehow. Don't worry, because justice is ultimately in the hands of Hashem. But this Pasuk relates to as well to what appears to us sometimes as a lack of justice in general, in life, whereas righteous people suffer and the wicked people prosper. How could that be? How could it be that somebody should come to court who's so innocent and so righteous and they're going to say, no, you're 
a wicked man. You deserve to be in jail for 25 years. He never did anything wrong, as they say in English. He was framed. Framed. Every so often you hear it in the news. A guy sat 25 or 30 years in jail and was just let out now. He's not the one that did it. They just found out through his DNA. They kept the DNA. Now they let him loose. 30 years behind bars. Why? There's a reason for that. Part of the reason is in the, is in this, in the next pasuk. In other words, only Hashem really knows who's a tzaddik and who's a rasha. Hashem judges both. There's a time for everything and for every maaseh that occurs. In other words, in the end, there's a reason behind everything. Hashem knows who's a tzaddik and who's a rasha. We may not always know it. And in the end, the second part of the pasuk that he says, Dalkola Maaseh Sham is even though there may not be justice now, in the end there will be justice. He didn't pay for it now, he's gonna end up paying it for it later. So let's explain each one of these pasuk, each one of these explanations. One is that we don't really know who's a tzaddik and who's a rasha, and the other one is that we don't see justice now, we may see it later. Good and bad is something that is not always clear. When we see somebody suffering, we think it's bad, it could be something good. It could be an atonement for our sins. And remember, everything that comes down from above is good. So it's always best to say we don't understand, not to, to have questions and to complain, because in the end, nothing is really bad. Everything is kapara and is true. In life, there is something called a cause and effect, right? As a result of doing something, there's an effect. You sometimes see the consequences of the cause immediately, and sometimes it takes a long time. What's a quick example of cause and effect? An upset stomach. You ate something bad, rotten, spoiled. How long does it take for you to feel it in the stomach? Does anybody know? Well, within an hour or two, the most. You're going to go to the bathroom. You're going to have diarrhea, perhaps. You're going to have stomach pains. There are some things that take a whole lifetime to see. <coughs> Damage to the lungs as a result of smoking. It's cumulative. You don't see it right away, but it's damaging. Do you see it right away? No. Over many, many years, all of a sudden he begins to cough. He goes and gets a scan. It's all black instead of pink. Only then does he see the damage that has accumulated. So the cause was done, right? The effect it took a long time for it to affect. The same thing happens with ma'asim. Some ma'asim, we see the consequences right away. Sometimes it takes time. Why does it take time? Hashem sometimes does not want it to interfere with free will. If we would see an immediate cause, effect, situation for every ma'asim, we would all be tzaddikim. Here's a quick story. <coughs> there was a landlord, who, who's one of his, a Jewish landlord, who's one of his tenants in Eastern Europe 100 years ago, was a widow with a few kids. She had no money, she's a widow. The community supported her, but somehow she became late on her rent. The landlord threatened to kick her out, to evict her. The community asked him to please be patient, that you're gonna to try to collect, put some money together to help her. They helped, but apparently it was not enough. He didn't want to kick her out, throw her in the street and bring the sheriff, so what did he do? He removed the roof. In those days, it was, you can easily remove the roof. And as a result of that, it snowed in, it rained in, it was cold, and they were compelled to leave. They couldn't live in that kind of house. So basically, he threw them out for not paying the rent. When the one rabbi heard about it, he said, you're going to see this landlord's going to pay for this. With widows, orphans, you're playing with fire. Year goes by, two years go by, nothing happens to him. He's successful, he's prosperous, making money, doesn't lose property, no problems. They ask the rabbi, what's going on? Be patient. Not everything happens right away. 25 years later, only 25 years later, this man died in a plague. There was a plague. People were dying, 
he was the one of the died in the plague. Now, the problem with the plague is that it's contagious. It's very, very dangerous if you handle this. This guy died in the street. Nobody wanted to pick him up. Nobody took him to be buried because everybody was afraid. It rained on him. It snowed on him. His elderly father, elderly father in his 80s, he's the only one that approached the body, I think, after who knows how many weeks, because he had no choice, and dragged him to try to bury him. Look what this man went through. Midah keneke midah, an eye for an eye, measure for measure, because of what he did. 25 years later, yes. Why 25 years? Only Hashem knows. The reason why things don't happen right away is not only to allow for free will, it also is because sometimes we think of a person as a rasha. He may be so because of the number of sins, but maybe he has a mitzvah that he did that is protecting him. We see somebody who's a tzaddik because of the number of mitzvot, but perhaps there's one avira that is accusing him and won't let go of him. Terrible avira that he did once when he was a teenager. Who knows? We don't know. Ki adam yireh la'inaim, the pasuk says, v'ashem yireh la'levav. Man sees with his eyes, Hashem sees with the heart. In other words, through the heart. Hashem really knows what's going on. We don't really know who's a tzaddik and who's a rasha. We think we know. We don't always know. And besides, even if a person is a tzaddik now, maybe what he's paying right now is for a previous reincarnation. So he has a certain mazav that it takes into account a previous life. So even though he's righteous now, it's already written from before he was born what it's going to be like, regardless of his deeds. Oh, but he's righteous. He doesn't deserve it. He's righteous now. But what he's getting is because of what was written from before. That has to do with the previous lifetime. So therefore, we can't see. We don't have the clarity to be able to distinguish between Siddiqui and Rashaim. That is why the, the rabbis call this world Alma the Shikra. It's a, it's a world of lies. It's a, it's a world of falsehood. You don't see things clear. Sometimes it's exact opposite of what you see. You don't know. You see a Rasha who lives in a 50,000 square foot home. Servants. He has a Rolls Royce and a Lamborghini and a Jaguar. <laughs> he has all the goodies. Enjoying life. Nothing bad happens to him. He has good kids too. And uh, maybe even more than one wife. <laughs> <laughs> but he's happy. What's going on? Do you know that I can take you to a jail and you're going to be puzzled. You're going to see a prisoner who's having steak and a milkshake because he's not Jewish. So you can have the milk and the steak, right? He's having a steak. He's having a milkshake. He's having the best foods that you can imagine. And you would say to yourself, I can't believe that this is happening in a jail. That this prisoner is being treated so well that he's getting the best food. But when you go ask the guy who's in charge, he will tell you the truth. He says, don't you understand that this is his last meal? <laughs> 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 They're hanging him the next day. <laughs> so we're giving him the last meal. When you see sometimes a real rasha, that we know for sure is a rasha, wicked, that he's enjoying life so well, it could be this is his last meal. After that, Gehenom, Gehenom, right? The worst of the worst. Hashem is paying him off the little bit of good that he did in this world. We don't understand, so we have all these questions, but this is what it could be. A Rasha who sees a righteous man suffering, if anything he should learn from this, should be a Musara skill. Wait a minute, if the righteous good people are in pain, I have to worry about it. The, the, the evil people have to worry when they see the good people suffering. If anything, they should realize, if they are going through hard times, you know what this means, what eventually may happen to one who's, who's a rasha. But the Yetzara, of course, tries to mislead us. Yeah, don't you see, there's nothing to it. But no, if you really pay attention to it, if the good people are suffering, you will really, uh-oh, then what are the bad people going to do? What are they going to go through? This is what's happening to the good. That is why the Holocaust should be looked at with different eyes. There are people who look at it. You see? God did not exist. He was not in the Holocaust. He was not around. He took a vacation, or whatever they say. You, how could there be a God and allow these things to happen? 
On the contrary, there has to be a God if these kinds of things can happen. If good people that didn't do any wrong, who practiced Torah, who gave their lives for Torah, who prayed every day and did tzedakah and did chesed, if they can go through this Holocaust, if this is what can happen to them, it can only be because there is a God. Only. Because otherwise, <laughs> this would not happen. In other words, it goes against logic. In other words, if such people are going through, you see what I mean? That's another way of, of looking at it. If such people are suffering and going through, then it must be that there is a God who for some reason, that we don't know, wants them to suffer. People look at, no, there must be that there's no God. <laughs> no, there is. Because of this, there must be a God. How, otherwise, how would he let... It, it wouldn't happen like that. It's not logically acceptable. It doesn't make sense that good people like that should just suffer. And this is, of course, not the only time it happened in history. There has been other times. Just to finish up, because we don't understand many things that happen, because we don't really know who's a tzaddik and who's a rasha, because we don't know people's intentions, we don't, can't read their minds, the rabbis remind us and warn us, be careful. Ladun et kol adam give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Give him the benefit of that because you don't really know what he's all about. You don't really know why he did what he did. You don't know why he said what he said. You don't know what's on his mind and his heart. Give the benefit of the doubt. Don't judge incorrectly. And based on this concept, one rabbi once gave an explanation about the Holocaust. Imagine if we're obligated to give the benefit of the doubt to the human beings, the more so to give the benefit of the doubt to the Almighty. If we are told to judge favorably a human being because we don't understand his intentions, we don't read his mind, the more so that we should apply this concept to God. God, I give you the benefit of the doubt. I trust that you know what you're doing. I don't understand it. We are told to do this with human beings, the more so with God. And let's not forget what we say in Hazinu, Hanistarot Lashem Elokeinu, Vaniglot Lanu Vaneinu, all those things that are hidden, that are concealed from us, that we don't know the reason, explanation for it, that's for Hashem, only He knows. There are certain things in life like that that we will never figure out while we are alive. And we shouldn't be bothered by that. We don't know everything. But what we should know is the other pasuk that says, Hatsul Tamin Paolok Ichol Derachad Mishpat Ele Muna Ben Avel Tzadik V'yasharu The God is just. He's pure. Complete. There's no corruption to His ways. He's only good. We have to remember that. If that's the case, we're not going to question Him because we know whatever He does is for the good. And last but not least, there's a beautiful blessing in the brachot of the haftarah that we say on Shabbat that most people do not pay attention to. One word, one clause, one idea that is inserted there that we don't even realize what it is. And that is tzaddik bechol hadorot. If you remember that, read, if you ever get a chance, look up the brachot of the haftarah that are said afterwards. And we say there that Hashem is a tzaddik bechol hadorot in all the generations. What's that all about? Because when you look at life, when you look at an event, when you look at a certain incident, we're sometimes we're sometimes amazed, we're puzzled, we don't understand. Because we don't. What you should do is look at all of history. Look at all the generations. You may have some questions to Kadosh Baruch Hu when you're looking at this time, at this year, at this event. Why? Why is this happening? Sir, look at Kol Hadorot. Look at the entire history. Look at everything. Look at all the generations. When you begin to look at all the generations, you begin to see a picture that is going to emerge, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in fact, is a tzaddik, that he is righteous. By looking at one segment in life, so, so minute and small, it's really difficult to figure out. We don't know as it is. Even if we look at everything, we'll never know everything. If you begin to look at the whole history of the whole generations, you will see that Hashem is tzaddik the whole other thing.